Welcome to the Physics Classroom's video tutorial on work and energy. The topic of this video is work energy example problems, and we want to know how do you use the work energy relationship to solve problems involving speed, height, and distance. I'm Mr. H. Let's get started. In two previous videos, these two, I discussed two distinct situations. In the first situation, external energy transfer, work is done by non-conservative forces to transfer energy across the system boundary. In such cases, the amount of initial mechanical energy in that system is different than the amount of final mechanical energy, and we would relate the work done by non-conservative forces to the energy by this equation. The W and C here refers to work done by non-conservative forces, that is, forces other than gravity and spring forces. In the second in the second situation, mechanical energy gets conserved. Work's not done by non-conservative forces. In effect, that W and C term cancels out and the equation becomes this. When you have this situation of mechanical energy being conserved, the sum of the kinetic and potential energy is always the same, initially as it is finally. We're going to be discussing these situations in this video and solving problems involving the use of these two equations. The fact is that whatever energy is, it's something that we can keep track of. And by keeping track of energy, you can determine how fast an object's moving, how high it will go, and how far it will skid. In this video, we'll be using these equations here along with three others. First, the kinetic energy equation that Ke is equal to one-half mass times speed squared. The equation for gravitational potential energy is that Pe grav is equal to mass times g times the height. g here is 9.8 newtons per kilogram on planet Earth. And finally, we need the equation for work done by non-conservative force you take that force, you multiply by the displacement of the object, and by the cosine of the angle theta between the force and the displacement vector. Let's discuss a problem-solving strategy for how to approach these problems. The first step is to read the problem carefully. Get a mental picture of what's going on. It helps to diagram it. The second step is to look for numerical values within the problem. These are the knowns. Identify what they are by writing them down and relate them to symbols within your equation. For instance, say something like HI equal 21.7 meters. Also identify what the unknown value is, what you're looking for. It might be something like VF equal question mark. The third step is to simplify your work energy equation. Turn that five-term equation into a simpler form. Look for terms like starts from rest and comes to a stop, moves across level ground, or moves with a constant speed in order to simplify terms that are zero or are the same on both sides of that equation. The fourth step is to take the numerical values that you know and substitute them into the equation. Then perform the necessary algebra steps in order to solve for the unknown. Our first example problem is about a 925 kilogram car that's moving at 8 meters per second along a level highway and it skids to a stop. The coefficient of friction, mu as we call it, is 0.816 and we want to know what distance does it skid before stopping. So when I go to write down my known values, I'm going to write down the initial speed and the final speed and the mass values and I'm going to write it like that. I'm also going to write down the value for mu, the coefficient of friction, and I'm going to pay attention to the fact that the road is level, so the initial height and the final height are both zero. Now this is what I'm picturing. A car's moving along a level highway, initially with 8 meters per second, it's got kinetic energy, finally it's stopped, no kinetic energy, and I'm looking for the value of d. I'm going to take my equation, my work energy equation, this five-term equation, and I'm going to simplify it by canceling any zero terms. Now the Ke final is zero, it stopped, and the initial potential and the final potential are both zero because it's on the ground. So I now have a two-term equation, Kei plus W and C equals zero. Now I'm going to take the Kei and expand it to say one-half MVI squared because that's how we'll be calculating it. And for W, I'm going to go the force of friction times D times the cosine of the angle between the F and the D. Now in this diagram, the car is moving to the right and friction acts to the left. So the force vector is left, the displacement vector is right, and the angle between oppositely directed vectors is 180 degrees. So I substitute that into this equation. The right side is zero. Now, for the force of friction, it's always mu f norm. That's from another unit. And on a level surface, the normal force from the surface is equal to the gravity force on the car. So f friction is equal to mu times the gravity force, or mu times mg. Now pay attention to that cosine of 180 there. If you don't know what it is, try it on your calculator. It's negative 1. 
So that second term is actually a negative term because of the cosine of 180, and I can swing it around to the right side of the equation and make it positive. And that's what I've done in this next step, along with substituting values into the equation, like 925 for m and 8 for v. And I have over on the other side the 0.816 for mu and the 925 for m and the 9.8 for the value of g. I'm looking for d, one equation, one unknown. Pull out your calculator, evaluate the left side, then evaluate everything in front of the d on the right side and write it down. Now you're solving for d. So what you want to do is divide both sides of that equation by the 7397 figure. And when you do, you'll get the value of d. Do it on your calculator, and it comes out to be a little short of 4. In fact, it rounds to 4.00 meters. In our second problem, we have a 54 kilogram ski jumper starting from rest at a known height of 153 meters high. Goes down the slope towards the takeoff point. And we know at takeoff point, it's 62 meters high. And we know that there's work done by friction and air resistance. We know the amount. It's negative 5920 joules. We want to know how fast is this person going at takeoff. So when I write what I know, I'm going to list the mass. I'm going to list the initial speed at zero. I'm going to list the initial height. I'm going to list the final height. And I'm going to list this negative work value done by friction and air resistance. I'm picturing this situation with work being done along the slope. And it's negative work. What do I want to know? I want to know how fast is it going. That's a V value, the VF, the final velocity at takeoff point. So I'm going to take my equation, and I'm going to simplify it. That five-term equation cancels to four when I figure that the initial kinetic is zero. The ski jumper starts from rest. Now I'm going to take that equation, and I'm going to expand it to use the variables like 1 half mv squared and mghs. And I have this equation. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute my known values. I have them all listed there. I just bring them down and insert them where they belong. And when I do, it looks something like this. Now, there's a 1 half 54 times v final squared. That simplifies to 27 vf squared. Everything else there can be calculated on your calculator. Find out what they are. Then, when you're done, you should have something that looks like this. And take that 32810 term, which is on the side with 27 vf squared, subtract it from both sides so it cancels from the 27 vf squared side and that's by itself and it ends up on the other side use your calculator to evaluate what 808967 and negative 5920 and negative 32810 is comes out to be this and now know 27 vf squared is equal to 42237 divide both sides by the 27 and you end up with vf squared is 1564 and some change Take the square root of both sides, and you get something like 39.55. Round it to two significant digits here, and it's 40 point meters per second. Example 3 is about a roller coaster car moving along a level track and slowing down. When I ask, what do I know? Well, I know the mass, I know the initial speed, I know the final speed, I know the force that acts upon the car, and I know the track is level, so HI is equal to HF, which is equal to zero. I'm picturing something that looks like that. What am I looking for? The distance between that initial speed and final speed location. I take my work energy equation and I simplify it. And when I do, I use the fact that the track is level and the car is on the track. So both terms are zero. They cancel from the equation. Now I expand each term in this three-term equation with 1 half mv squared and um, fd cosine theta. And you'll notice that the cosine of theta is cosine of 180 degrees because the object, the roller coaster car, is moving to the right, but its force is against it to slow it down. So the angle between the f and the d vector is 180 degrees. Now, I'm going to substitute known values into this equation, and it looks something like that. You'll notice that that second term on the left side becomes negative because the cosine of 180 is negative 1. Now what I want to do is pull out my calculator and evaluate each of the terms, the first term and the third term. And it turns into something like this. Now I'm going to get the 7210d term by itself. And the way I'm going to do that is add it to both sides of the equation. And I'm going to subtract the 2368 from both sides of the equation. And I end up with something that looks like this. I'm trying to solve for d. So I divide both sides of the equation by 7210. I pull out my calculator and find out what that is. And it's about 11 meters. Example 4 is about a ball that is launched horizontally from the top of a tall cliff, and I'm picturing something that looks like that. What I know is I know the mass of the ball, and the height initially, and I know the height finally, and I know the initial speed. And what I'm looking for is the final speed. 
I told to assume negligible resistance forces. So I go to take my work energy equation to simplify it, and I recognize that the PEF is zero, and I also recognize that the only force doing work is gravity. It's a conservative force, so W and C is equal to zero. Now I have a three-term equation, and I'm going to expand each term with the formula for KE and PE, so it looks something like this, and substitute known values in for mass and heights and speeds. And I have this situation. I'm going to pull out my calculator and evaluate and simplify each term of the equation. It turns it to this, and I have this VF squared term over on the right side. I'm looking to find out what VF is. So I'm going to do two algebra steps in one here. I'm going to take the two terms on the left side and add them together, combine them, and then divide through both sides by 0.125. When I'm done, I got this, VF squared is equal to the 1536 figure. Now that's VF squared. If you don't want to know what VF is, you must take the square root of both sides. And when you do, you end up with 39.2 meters per second. In example five, a ball is thrown upwards. And I know its mass and its initial speed. And I want to know how high it will go. So when I ask, what am I given? I'm given the mass value. I'm given the initial height of zero. I'm given the initial speed of 24.5. And I know that when it's at its highest point, it will have momentarily run out of that speed. And it will be a final speed of zero meters per second. What am I looking for? I'm looking for the final height. How high does it go? Now I take my work energy equation and I simplify it. I know that the initial PE is zero. It starts from zero height. And I know that when it reaches its highest point, it's not moving. So the kinetic energy finally is zero. And the only force doing work on this ball is the force of gravity. That's a conservative force. And so the W and C is equal to zero. So I have a two-term equation. I can expand it with the formulas for, M, for KE and PE. And then I can substitute in known values of M, V, and G. And I have this equation. Pull out your calculator and simplify both sides. And then you're looking for HF. So divide through both sides of the equation by this 5.7036 figure. And when you're done, you have the final height of 30.6 meters. In my sixth and final problem, I have this situation of a bicyclist coasting, not pedaling, on top of one hill and then goes into the valley and up on top of a second hill. And I want to know how much higher is the first hill than the second hill. So when I ask what do I know, I know the VI and I know the VF. And I'm going to try to find what is the height of the, of the first hill if I call the second hill a zero height. I'm looking for HI, given that HF is zero. I take my work energy equation and I simplify it. I cancel out the PEF term since HF has been declared zero. And the W and C term is zero as well, since the only force doing work is the force of gravity, a conservative force. Now I'm going to take the term, the three energy terms, and write the expression 1 half mv squared and mgh in for them. And at this point, I'm getting ready to substitute, but I don't know my mass. But if you look at the equation, there's an m in each term. So if you were to divide through every term of the equation by m, you'd still have an equal sign, but the m's would cancel. And then you could solve for the what's the initial height. So I do that, and then I substitute my values of vi and vf into the equation. I take the first term left side and last term on the right side, and I evaluate it on my calculator. I have something that looks like this, and I'm trying to solve for hi. So I'm going to keep the hi term on 9.8 hi on one side, and I'm going to subtract 21.125 from both sides so as to isolate 9.8 hi. When I do, I have this, and I'm going to divide through each side of the equation by 9.8, pull out my calculator and evaluate that, and it comes out to be 1.275 meters. To two significant digits, that's 1.3 meters. It's at this time in every video that I like to help you out with an action plan. But before I help you out, could you help us out by giving us a like, subscribing to the channel, or leaving a question or comment in the comments section below. Now for your action plan. Here are three resources that you'll find on our website. I've left links to each of them in the description section of this video. You have two Minds on Physics missions, each of which deals with the two situations we've been discussing. And you have a calculator pad section that has a problem set with questions, answers, and audio guided solutions. And finally, you have a tutorial page. Whatever you do, I wish you the best of luck. I'm Mr. H, and I thank you for watching.